Hey guys, was that a good song or what? Man, that last song we sang, I was, are we singing that in the second service? We're singing that again. I'm probably going to stick around for the second service. Huh? <laughs> I really like that song. See, I could have sang that song and just went home. So I wouldn't have had to stay here and listen to me preach. But because, because the truth is in a lot of these songs we sing. So never get caught in a song service. We're not just doing a worship time. There's so much truth. You sing, come all ye faithful. Listen to that. Come all ye faithful. It says, oh, come let us adore him man if we don't pursue personal relationship with god if we don't get to know him for who he really is apart from just what scripture says i'm talking about i talked to a man back here tonight or today this morning he said man i was praying this morning and 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 i was spending time in the lord see that's precious to me that's one of my whole goals is standing up here flying to places and preaching that we would pursue to get to know him more that you'd never let church attendance take the place of knowing him you never let the service that you do for your church take the place of knowing him or your ministry take the place of knowing him. Knowing him is the transformation of your life. Like we're here to get to know him, not just know about him and be able to preach about him. You can pastor, study your Bible, have seminary degrees and talk all about the Lord and actually not truly know him because you haven't spent intimate time with him. Knowing about the Lord is way different than knowing the Lord. Knowing the Lord will transform your life. Knowing about the Lord will convict your life. Like it'll convict your life and make you feel like. Let me say it this way. Without relationship with the Lord, you will be reduced to feeling indebted to him and serving him instead of knowing him as a friend. In the Old Testament, there was concubines. And there was a queen. There was a wife, there was a concubine. They both got pretty close to the king. Yeah, y'all followed me? All that a concubine did was serve the king and wait on the king and every once in a while brush against his glory. Every once in a while get called into his chamber. You can go to church and live as a concubine. You can just wait for an encounter. You can just live for the goosebump. You can just say, wow, I hope we sing that song again. It really touched me. It's the closest I felt to the Lord in a long time. And all of a sudden, it's realized that you're living like a concubine. You're doing things for him and living far from him. Don't ever live like a concubine. Don't just serve the Lord. Be in him. When you're through the day, through the day, talk to him. Wake up in the morning, condition your heart. Man, I don't care if you put sticky notes on your mirrors to trigger your heart, but don't just get up and live normal, what you call normal, and just live in the flesh and then think about God later in the day or come to church and haven't even communed with him before you got here. Because that's the trap of religion. You'll all of a sudden let the things you do in his name take the place of knowing him. I've said that about 10 times on purpose, I think. I didn't even plan to go here. I was totally in a different place when I stood up here. But, but this just feels right to me. Uh, religion is a wretched, wretched, wretched thing, people. Uh, relationship with God is what we have through Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father except through him. You know what we've done? We've made Jesus the way to heaven. So we pray and get a passport and get, a, get our name signed down. We're on the list. So when the trumpet blows, we're in. There's no scripture that emphasizes Jesus is the way to heaven. He's the way back to the Father. The Father's eternal, so we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Why? Because in the beginning, God never made man to die. God made man to live forever in him. He said, the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. So death was never in the plan. That's why death isn't in the plan in eternal life through Jesus Christ, because Jesus restored us back to what always was. So the born again experience is God taking you out of darkness, out of the life you were living, out of the mentalities you had, the perspective you had, the motive you had, the will you had. He's taking you out of darkness and placing you back into the light as if sin never happened, as if Adam never ate the tree, as if you never missed it. 
That's how God's treating you through the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope you understand that. That takes away guilt and condemnation and shame. That's why there's a joy to our salvation. Because we're not second guessing. We're not regretting. We're not living in yesterday. We just sang it. All things were made new. Life begins with you. You get it? Come on, it's exciting. Don't be overwhelmed by my passion. I know I came out of here just like, duh. But we just sang a song that is full of truth that we could just actually go home if we believe it and just shine and manifest Jesus and love one another. Because that's the whole reason that he came. I promise you, I, I, well, I, this is my fourth time standing here already this weekend. This weekend flew. This is my fourth time. For some of you, this is your first time. With me. So you're like, what in the world? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm awake. I, we just sang a song that I have new life through Jesus Christ. You cannot put new into old. You can't keep the same motives, the same perspectives, the same motives and mindsets and will. The, the, the gospel gives you a whole new reason for being. Like, like. I, I want everyone to forgive all of us preachers that, and I'm not talking about Sheldon, that never just told the whole truth. Said, I don't know him that well, but I'm not projecting on Sheldon in this house. I would never do that. What I'm saying is we've told a piece of the story. We've preached a message that benefits us and doesn't transform us maybe. It gives us something from God, but doesn't give us who he is in our expression in our life. We are, we are not ever scripturally compelled to just make the goal of the gospel your destination heaven. The goal of the gospel is your destination new life through Jesus Christ. That's why you were compelled to get up here and sing that again. You don't know this, but I'm sitting there and we're singing this song and that paragraph went, <gasps> and it was like, duh. That's what it's all about. And then I knew that we were in a direction. Then Pastor Sheldon gets up and says, he goes over and he says, can we just sing that again? And what paragraph does he sing? <laughs> Guys, we can't miss this. Listen, what we just sang is a cry different than if you sinned, pray this prayer, he'll forgive you, write your name in a book, and when you die, you'll go to heaven. You can do that and be still self-centered, be mad at your boss and shout down your spouse. So you got a ticket to eternal life. Okay, is that the goal? No, it's a ticket to new life. Where old things pass away, behold, all things become new. It's in your Bible. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anybody be in Christ, they're a new creation. Oh, come on. They're a new creation. See, I don't have altar calls, ever have altar calls that if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. The goal is never to go to heaven. The goal is to get heaven back into you. The goal is to get new life through Jesus Christ. We've done an injustice in this country, making the whole goal just to repeat a prayer that we call the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer is about 80 years old. The sinner's prayer we came up with as a neat tool. I'm not against the sinner's prayer. But the goal is not to get to heaven. The goal is to get heaven back into you. And you're going to live forever and have eternal life. But you have this little light to shine on this little life to shine the light of Christ on the earth and impact as many people as you can. Your goal is not to get to heaven. Your goal is to live Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Why would we have that scripture if it stops with the sinner's prayer and now we're going to heaven and then we hold on tight to get through the hell till we get there? Not the case. We are full of life through Jesus Christ. We have put down the old. We have put on the new. We have put on the, off the things of flesh. We live by the spirit. It's not hard to forgive anymore because we've been forgiven of everything we've ever done. It's not hard to be merciful because we have received mercy. The spirit of God is inside of us and we're called to walk in love and love one another. And if he loved us this way, we ought to love the same. That's the gospel. I preach it everywhere I go. I want you to have impact. I want you to wake up every day and understand who you are and why. And let Christ matter more. And don't let life ever speak louder than truth.
You're not here to get a blessing. You're here to get stirred up in love and good works. Because you just come here, but you live there. And as you go, you get it? As you go, you got to be very, very careful. You don't slip in to what so many slip into. I'm not saying this because you're doing it. I'm saying it so you never do. You have to be so careful that you don't just get in a routine where you just come to service because you're part of Watford Assembly. No, you come to service to gather together to celebrate a truth, to rejoice in the truth, to stay focused and get empowered so that when you leave here, you look just a little bit more like him than when you came. That's the reason we gather according to scripture. There was never any scriptural indication in the New Testament that we should do this just to pay homage to God, just to give our tithes and keep a, a ship on the water called the Assembly of God building. No, no, no. This is a place. This is a meeting house. This is a place where we sharpen, we edify, we encourage, we remove deception, we build up weak things. And it's like a football huddle in a play, man. We got the ball and the clock is ticking and man, we're going to score and we're like break and we go out into the field you see what i'm saying that's what church gathering was always intended to be by the lord we have made it a lot of other things we have turned it into church shopping looking for a church we like looking for a personality we appreciate oh i really like my pastor but then it's amazing six months later you think he's changed and he ain't like he was when we came so you keep shopping and now pastors are trying to produce the product that people are looking for and next thing you know it's just all about us in his name instead of all about him through us are you hearing me I know you're hearing me because I feel like a madman this morning for some reason. I'm like, ah. it just feels aggressive. It feels so serious, but it's not to overwhelm you. Maybe it's to get our attention. I don't know. But we just sang, all things are new. Now, I'm not judging you. I'm not challenging you. I'm saying, are you relating to that? Because if you're not relating to that, that's what God's saying to you then. Then you got to look at that and say, what's that mean for me? All things new. Is this just a spiritual position? So spiritually, positionally, I'm seated in heavenly places. Positionally, I'm forgiven, but I'm still the same person, same weaknesses, same tendencies, same deceptions. No, the Bible calls you to live in the spirit. The Bible calls you to put off those things and put on Christ. The Bible talks about his image being in you and me. It says you're beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord. He's talking about your potential, your purpose, your destiny. He said in being transformed into his same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. That doesn't sound like talking down your life. That doesn't sound like saying, well, you know, we're just evil, old, wicked flesh, brother. It's a wonder God even considers us. No, you were evil, wicked flesh. You're supposed to have a new heart, a new life. You're transformed. You're transformed. All things became new. You're not the same. It's not cool to boast in your ability to fail and call that humility. That's called lack of understanding. You didn't wake up to fail today. You woke up to shine. You woke up to be more like him. You woke up to be in fellowship with God, accepted by him and received. And oh my goodness, this is righteousness at its finest. You wake up, put sticky notes on your mirror, man. Remember who you are. Remember why. Don't forget the truth. If you got to do that, do that. But that way you won't just get up and burp and pass a little gas and be mean to your spouse. Yeah. And just grumble and groan because it's cold and you got to go to work and it's the grindstone and you can't stand it. And I don't have to work my whole life. I got like 40 years to I retire. This is a bunch of blah. God, I need your grace. You're not getting grace when your attitude's there. You can talk like you're praying all you want. You're just complaining and heaven ain't hearing. Did you pray today? Oh, yeah, I prayed, man. <laughs> this is what prayer looks like for a lot of people. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, man. Oh, God, it, is, it feels like it's going to be one of them days, man. If you don't do something, I ain't going to do good. You, so I'm telling you, you got to do something or I ain't doing good, man. 
<laughs> and it, you, grunt, you grumble and you don't have vision, purpose. You haven't believed for anybody in your workplace. You're a little disgruntled with your boss. Maybe your highest faith is God. If you don't change that boss, I know it ain't right, but I feel like I want to punch him, God. So either do something in my heart or change him because I can't take him anymore. That is not prayer. That is crazy deception. <laughs> you don't need a new job. You have new life. You're not called. You're not called for everybody around you to change according to what you desire. You're called to be more like him so that everybody around you sees who he is through your life. Nobody has to treat you right for you to be okay. <laughs> you don't have to like me for me to be full of joy. Nobody can do anything about it. <laughs> like the spirit of God is inside of me. Like I woke up today and Jesus lives in me. Ah! Like, and he loves me. Like, like, come on. That is not a baby in a manger Christmas thing. That is the reality of life in him. And it's new life. It's not old life. It's not woe is me. And I can't believe they said that. And that really hurt. And well, I'm not, well, I ain't doing it. Well, they shouldn't. Have. No, whatever. Somehow we got tricked into thinking all oh, that's normal because that's all we've ever known. Well, we were born into Adam, folks. We were born into life apart from God and nobody in this room, nobody, nobody in this room had a clue who they were when they were born. And growing up, you needed, you needed appreciated, you needed honored, you needed stability, you needed security. And a lot of us didn't have a lot of those things. You needed somebody to say something nice to you and write to you. You didn't feel good about yourself at times. Somebody laughed at you in third grade and you realized they were laughing at you. Now you have to choose. You either get introverted and low esteemed or you get hardened to become a fighter. But either way, no matter how you respond, it's not the real you. It's nothing more than your response to life. Your response to life. And the whole time we're vulnerable. Why? Because we're living apart from him and have no identity. It's the truth, man. We were born into Adam. And you must be born again. And somehow we turned that into a beneficial prayer that takes me to a destination someday. Instead, it gives me a new way of living and a brand new life. <laughs> well, I ain't going to buy into that. That's a piece of the gospel, not the gospel. I never got saved to go to heaven. When I got saved, I got saved. So I become what he paid for. And so that I live what he desires. And so that I walk in the will of God. The last reason on the earth I got saved was so I don't go to hell. I got saved so that I become everything he ever predestined if he's really lord why wouldn't i want that if i'm not living what i'm here for why wouldn't i want to once i have a conviction so you put off these things and you put on these things and you live in new life through jesus christ i know i'm aggressive this morning i'm sorry it's like i said one of those services i was pretty calm in the beginning should have came to the first service and got broke in. <laughs> so this is your judgment for not coming. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm having fun. I'm being lighthearted because God doesn't want anybody overwhelmed right now. He just wants you thinking and hearing and conviction is good. Shine light upon. Duh. Why does repentance always have to be like? Wah! Repentance is just like, duh. Yeah. What was I thinking? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Come on, that's repentance. Er, change the way you think. It doesn't have to. Be... Usually that's just remorse and you don't even see an answer. Repentance is full of life, man. Repentance is repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. The spirit of God is in you. Repent. You have a higher calling and destiny than you've maybe pursued. Repent. You might be using God to try to survive and God's in you so you can shine. You're not trying to make it to the end. You already made it forever. This day takes you to that day. Write a legacy. Leave a deposit. Sow as many seeds as you can. Lay down your life for the gospel. 
Yeah? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and go ahead and follow him. And let's be very impressive people on the earth that bring glory to the one we call king. Yeah, that sure beats discouragement, frustration, offense. Pastor, we need to talk because my husband's a jerk. My wife is a witch. That, that's bad stuff, man. It's all the time. I, I, I pastored. And it's people struggling with people all the time. 99% of your appointments are people struggling with people. True? Rarely is it just, hey, I just need a little wisdom on this. And usually it's people can't deal with people. That reveals that we haven't heard the gospel clear and given our hearts to the truth. Because you're called to deny yourself. Then why do you have so many issues? If you're really living for the glory of the king, why are you letting people get under your skin? You should have new skin. You should have a new motive. You should have a new reason for living. Because all things are new. How can you live hurt? How can you live offended? How can you still be talking about the bad thing that happened to you five years ago? And five years slipped by and you were nothing more than a product of that thing. And you've been molded by that. And the whole time he's the great potter. And all of a sudden you've been fashioned by life instead of the giver of it. And all of a sudden you're only as good as it's going instead of as good as he is. And all of a sudden these just become songs. Instead of the revelation and celebration of the truth that we all enjoy. Come on, good tidings of great joy. I'm not being mean. You have to look hard to find what the Bible's talking about, great joy. And when you find it, when you find it, we think they're putting on an act. Because no one can be that full of joy. The Bible says joy unspeakable. And if you ever bump into what that looks like, you'll feel like if you're not careful, you'll have to figure that out and identify it and judge it instead of being empowered and touched by it. I don't see great joy in the lives of so many. And it's the joy of your salvation, not your circumstances. Maybe we got tricked into listening to a gospel that benefits us without transforming us. And maybe we've tried to pour new wine into an old wineskin. And maybe the wineskin just keeps bursting and the new wine keeps spilling out. Maybe all things, Pastor John, need to become new. This isn't my sermon. Don't even write me nothing. It's not my sermon. It's the word of God. You want to go to a Colossians 3 with me? We'll just look. I'm excited. You ought to be happy because I'm happy. Yeah. Conviction's good. If you're sitting there going, oh my, that's okay. Don't elbow your spouse like I hope you're listening because then I'm definitely talking to you. <laughs> no, it's true. If you elbowed your spouse, it's too late. I'm all, I was talking to you. And spouse, if you elbowed him back, you're both, I'm talking to you. Why? Because we always let one person Decide who we are and how we are, and it's usually not Jesus. So somebody will come in an office of a pastor, and they're crying, and they're broken, and they say, well, I just can't take anymore, and they're this, and I don't know what, and we got to pray for them, and you got to, and all of a sudden, you need to realize I'm letting where one person isn't decide where I am. I'm letting what one person doesn't see decide my vision and he's the light of the world and I'm letting this decide. Hello, which proves we have a ton of expectations in our lives. We expect of one another and we set each other up to fail all the time, all the time. I like this guy. I'm just getting to meet him. He's funny, too. He's funny. He comes up with stuff, man. He got a good one last night. His little daughter rode home with us. She said, I, I, can I ride with you guys to the hotel? She's so sweet. And I'm like, it's Kimber. Kimber, she's just sweet. I know all the other kids are sweet, but I got to meet Kimber. So so, so he came out and said, uh, Kimber's going to ride with us. She really wanted to ride. She said she wants to ride with the man of God. And Dan, you can come too. <laughs> and she said, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> He's throwing her hands on her. I didn't say that. <laughs> she's so cute. <laughs> what he said he said Kimber wants to ride with a man of God and Dan you can come too 
Now watch this. Here's the paradox. You start developing a relationship. Say that Sheldon and I would have had to, for some reason, be close, or I would move into an area here, and we'd stay in connection, or even I'd just stay in connection. We get to spend time, more time together, and all this. If I'm not careful, and I don't understand these things, after a while, you just have unspoken expectations on people. You put your trust in flesh and don't even realize it. The danger with that is you set people up to fail you, disappoint you, jade and hurt your heart. It's happened to so many people. I fly all the time. I sit beside people. I'm a talker with them. They, they ask me how I'm doing. I'm not rhetorical. They say, how are you doing? I'm not like, oh, hanging in there, man. Yeah, I'm okay. Just glad my flight's on time. You ask me how I'm doing, I'm going to tell you. I go through security, and they're like, hey, how are you doing? Man, I'm amazing. Are you kidding? My sins are forgiven, and the Spirit of God lives in me, sir. I hope you know that. You love him, don't you? You love Jesus because, man, he loves you with his life. And you just pierce them with conviction and you go right on through and they're like, whoa. <laughs> I got up to the desk and the lady said, how you doing? Flying. How you doing? I said, I'm amazing. She said, whoa, that's a rare response. I said, I said, isn't that a shame, ma'am? I said, you know why it's rare? Because everybody's eyes gets fixed on the wrong things. I said, I finally realized why I'm here and who I am in that truth. His name's Jesus. He lives in me and I'm called to shine. I'm not here to make it and get by. I'm here to shine. Come hell or high water, honey. I'm going to shine. I'm so free. I'm amazing. She said, whoa. I just went on through. <laughs> Boy, that sure beats being discouraged. Still sitting on what somebody shouldn't have should have said. And I can't believe in letting things matter more than what matters most. Why am I this wild and aggressive this morning with you? Because I'm a believer. I actually believe scripture. Come on, I'm not being mean. I'm a believer. I'm not a scripture reciter. I'm a believer. And my life is free. And there's nothing you can do to hurt me, slow me down, or stop me. Because I didn't wake up to be loved by you. I woke up to be more like him. So you don't owe me a thing. My day's already set. You getting this? My day's set. You can't break my heart. You have no ability. You can't even kill me because I ain't going to die. You kill a family member. They're not going to die. We're all Christians. You're telling me if they kill a family member, you are. I won't be mad at God. I promise. And I'll cry for you because if you do that, you're really lost. Because we're fine. We're alive forevermore. We will never be judged for our sins. And the spirit of God is amazing in us. You could kill my family. I'm not going to change. I promise you, I'm not going to change. I already won. I see this thing. You can't take it out of me. It's in me. It's become the stronghold of the Lord. I was in home group a long, long time ago. I'm 25 years in. That's not a long time, but it's long enough for me to know. But I was only about a year in and I got a revelation and I'm in home group and a year in people flood my home. We're having fun. People are getting healed and things are happening and courage and hearts. And my home was flooded with people. We had a home group vision. We multiplied it like four times and raised up leaders. It was really cool. One day I was on my knees and I'm crawling and I didn't have room. There was people everywhere. So I'm crawling in between the people on my knees. I literally tore the buttons off my shirt. I know you can't imagine me that passionate, but I was preaching and I, and I literally I had my shirt. And when I was preaching, my buttons broke on my shirt. I tore my shirt. You're like, what? Listen to what I said. I started sharing the victory we have in Christ. And that I didn't wake up for better circumstances. My prayer and faith isn't wrapped around my day. Working the way I hope. Because if that's the case, your day is always deciding you. And at the end of the day, you're assessing your spirituality through the outcome. And you're always trapped in a self-serving, self-centered form of prayer that never lets you go free. I'm not saying it's wrong to believe for a new job, guys. Believe for a new job, but until you get the job, make sure you shine and walk in love and make peace and show mercy. And don't ever let your job become your issue and dictate your countenance or it's idolatry. Now you're letting your job decide your life instead of him. And now you're mad at God because he didn't give you the new job and you should have got the promotion. And I prayed and they even anointed me with oil and we believed. Why didn't God? And now you even have aught with God and now God somehow failed. Because it's still just all about you getting what you want. 
but he's my shepherd and I shall not want. See how much scripture I have on this? The Bible taught me this. The Bible taught me everything I'm telling you. Isn't that awesome? I'm in the middle of a story. If I need to finish it, I will. If I need to. I might have left you hanging on purpose. I don't know. I'm not going to finish that story. I feel like I need to go to Colossians 3. And if I need to finish that story, I will. Colossians 3. If then you were raised with Christ. Uh-oh. If then you were raised with Christ. Not word if isn't a challenge. He's not saying if you're really saved, prove it by this. The word if is a little Greek word and it actually means since. So he's saying you're, you're raised in Christ. He's not challenging if you were raised in Christ. He's saying since you're raised in Christ. So what he's saying is I believe your sincerity. I believe your repentance. I believe your prayers. I believe your hearts. And since you're now raised with Christ, this is the deal. Now I'm going to be honest with you and I'm not projecting on pastor. Nobody ever taught me this stuff growing up in church. Nobody ever taught me this stuff. Nobody ever taught me who I was in Christ and the purpose of God and the motive of God in my heart. They, they, nobody ever taught me. It was just always about heaven and it was some kind of warm hearted message to make me feel warm or something. I don't know, but nobody ever taught me that Jesus paid a price to get all the unproductive mindsets out of me so that I could actually live from where he's positioned and actually begin to walk in love and not take account of suffered wrongs and not give life so much power since he's the giver of life. Nobody ever taught me that I could actually be free. They just said that I was forgiven of my sins and they called that freedom. The positional forgiveness of your sins doesn't mean you're free. You can be bound to yourself. You can be bound to others. You can have needs that surpass what he fulfilled. Just because your sins are forgiven doesn't mean you're free. When we sing, I'm free, you're, it doesn't, it, that doesn't, it's not, it has nothing to do with your sins being forgiven. It has to do with you being free from you walking out the truth. <sighs> See, because until you live free from you, you can never be free. I said it last night. It's why married couples give each other the silent treatment. Get moody. Roll their eyes. Don't say anything at times. They express themselves through moods and expressions. It's selfish. It's manipulation. It's control. Jesus would never do that. So we just reveal that we don't know him like we could. It's not because we're evil. It's because we don't understand. I'm not talking to hypocrites. I'm talking to God's kids this morning. I'm not talking to hypocrites. I'm talking to God's children. But in all you're getting, get understanding. And what we don't know is destroying us. And it's a lie what you don't know won't hurt you. That's a lie. We grew up hearing it. We grew up hearing, well, if I were you, I wouldn't get my hopes up. Why do we say that? It's a self-serving phrase. What you're saying is, I'd hate to see you get all... And then get crushed and let down. Be better if you just don't get your hope up. And the Bible says, get your hope sky high. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is the anchor of your soul passing through the veil into his presence. Hebrews 6. The Bible says, get your hope up. And we say, well, if I were you, I wouldn't get my hope up. That's a self-serving phrase. That brings death in the long run. It never produces life. It's self-protective. The reason the Bible says get your hope up, it's, it's, it's expecting you to understand you already denied yourself. Yourself's not in the equation. How my spouse is treating me has nothing to do with how I'm doing. <laughs> Who Jesus is is how I'm doing. That's why I'm a madman. And you don't have to be like me. Don't let that scare you. you. Don't compare yourself to me. I'm just fired up about this thing, and I'm in a different position. I'm cheering on your hearts, man. But I'm like this. Yeah, I am. And you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to be like this. Just be the best you. Be the best you and live selfless and stop letting your heart get hurt and guard your heart because out of your heart flows the issues of life. And don't grow weary in well-doing. Do you hear all the scripture that tells us this? It's just one scripture after the other. Bam, bam, bam. That makes this 
the gospel. You get it? Come on, I'm not just pulling one little context out and trying to build a doctrine on it. Tons of scripture. Man, we're called to walk in love. It says love takes no account. How much account? Love takes how much account? No account of a suffer wrong. Then why are we so busted up by each other? Because we haven't been perfected in love and love's the goal. First Timothy 1 5 says the goal of our instruction, the purpose of the commandment is love. So if we fail to grow into love, we fail to accomplish and step into everything he paid for. The whole purpose of the cross is you being restored back to love, not going to heaven someday. God is restoring the image of God in man. Let us make man for our image. What was lost through sin? The image of God in man and man became cut off from God and became a God unto himself and became self-centered. So what was love a second ago became void of love a second later and instead of being love became in need of love. And everyone in this room was born into needing love. So where do you find love? Through another? To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge is to be filled with all the fullness of God. So you get grafted back into the source of love. You get loved by God to become the very thing you were created for love. Are you with me? The goal of our instruction is love. I said it last night. He who loveth is born of God and knows God. He who loveth not just doesn't know God. Doesn't say you don't preach. Doesn't say you don't travel and minister. Doesn't say you don't go on a mission trip and feed the poor. But it does say if you don't love, there's a reason. You don't know him like you could. Which means you can't know him without becoming like him. Why? Because it's in the grace he made you for his image. So it's a false pride to say, well, we're just fallen flesh. That's God. We're us. Christ in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, firstborn among many brethren. The things I do, you'll do if you believe. As he is, so are we in this world. Sounds like a connection. That was just like four scriptures. I could give you four more. They're all through the Bible, friends. And I'm just here to stir you up and cheer you on. I'm not mad at nobody. I didn't come to spank you. I didn't come to correct you and say, you guys need to get it straight. I came here to tell you who you are and don't miss this thing. We got the greatest thing in front of us that ever will be. Let's not miss our moment because this is our moment. Why? Because this is when we're alive on the earth. I've been noticing lately, like seeing things the year we just saw my wife and I saw a thing and it was a movie that they were showing somewhere and it was like in 58 or something. And she said, do you realize all those people are probably gone? And it just hit me. This is our season. Like a hundred years from now, none of us in this room will probably be here. There'll be a whole nother group of folks. This is your time. Don't use it trying to get by. Please understand and don't miss your moment. It's what faith does. Believers don't miss their moment. They deny themselves, pick up the cross and follow him because they're living for that day when they stand before him and they're going to be found as a believer. Not because they prayed at an altar one day when they were 16 but because they lived Christ every day because they walked through the unfairness. They walked through the betrayal and they didn't live betrayed. They shined as lights in the world and men saw their life and knew there was a God in their hearts. You want that testimony. I promise you, you want that legacy. No matter how it feels now, the pressures, the circumstances, I promise you, you want that end result that you believed God in the midst of it all. I promise you, you want that in the end. How is it going to be standing before him in that day? I don't even know. But I get these funny little pictures like the light of who he is is so amazing. Wouldn't you agree, Pastor? When you walk in his presence, is there going to be any deception? Or is everything going to turn crystal clear in a second? 
Do you think there could be deception looking into the eyes of his glory in the manifest presence of God? I'm talking about standing before him. Do you think there's going to be any deception? No. So people are going to look and go, oh, and their whole life's in front of them. And it'll already be answered. They'll already see and know. You're not going to be able to say, oh, you know, you know, I'd, I'd have believed in you more if it wasn't for my spouse. I mean, why didn't you answer my prayers? I prayed for years. Oh, get a higher vision than that. No, you're going to look in his eyes and go, oops. I let my spouse decide what I believe. I said you were Lord and never let you govern my life. I let my spouse decide who I was. Wow, my spouse was Lord the whole time. I was mad at you because you didn't change him. And I made this gospel all about what I get from you instead of what I become because of you. Wow, I was deceived. Don't let that happen to you. As painful as this feels in my heart to a couple of you, some of you aren't really excited about all this. In that day, if you live this, you'll be very thankful that a man came like a maniac and cried this stuff out. Because I promise you that day's coming. And we're all going to stand before him. And the last thing I want is petty emotions in the way of manifesting him. Petty motives in the way of manifesting him. Well, I was hurt. Why did you let them do that to me if you love me? No, you'll realize if he didn't love you, he'd have never sent his son and gave you the kingdom. You just didn't get your eyes on the kingdom. You got your eyes on stuff. And you allowed life to decide who you were and how you were instead of the very giver of it. Come on. I'm crying this out because I'm a friend, because I believe it. I promise you, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not judging anybody in this room. I'm saying, don't you let these things be you. You have a higher calling than being discouraged. You have a higher calling than being offended. You have a higher calling than living in right, rightness. Don't get caught up in social media and the he said, she said. I'm not saying social media is evil. I'm saying don't get caught up in the whole he said, she said of it. And I mean, somebody could put one thing and it just creates a bomb of oh, an opinion platform. And nothing's ever accomplished. It's just people are wise in their own opinion. And Paul said, it's the thing to never be. So isn't it amazing? We have a platform to be opinionated. And Paul said, don't ever be opinionated. And we have a major platform to voice your opinion with no accountability. It shouldn't be surprising. Isn't it amazing that James says, be slow to anger, slow to speak, and quick to listen. And most of us have been ticked off a whole lot to say and don't want to hear it. Not an accident. It's called the fall of man. It's the total opposite of what we're here for. We've been trained by the opposite of what we're here for. Love lays down its life for another. If it's not love, it lives at the expense of another. That silent treatment spouse thing I said, that's living at the expense of your spouse. That doesn't produce life. That puts a demand on them. When you're stewing all day because of some unresolved conflict and they come home from work, whether it's the man or woman, and you give them a silent treatment, it's control manipulation. You're actually, you're actually living at the expense of them, your marriage, and your home. And love would never do that. And then the person you're doing it to, your spouse, retaliates with some kind of move. And now it's a chess match of emotions. Boy, I pray that that would all die. And we would just be found in Christ. And learn how to cover a multitude of sin with love. And let mercy triumph over judgment. Tone down a harsh word with a kind word. And just go ahead and follow him instead of sing to him. That's what I pray. Yeah, I bet we can live this way with Holy Spirit in us. I bet if he said, follow me, I can. I bet it's not impossible. I bet we're not too far gone. I bet there's hope for all of us in him. I bet we can all get up in this moment and say, you know what? From this day forward, I'm going to start going after these truths and putting these things in my life. I'm going to start living to shine. I'm not going to be living to be treated right. I'm going to live to shine. I'm not going to find my identity through people because that's a rat race. I'm going to find my identity through him.
You cannot belong to this church to be loved. You'll feel like somebody didn't love you the way they should, and you'll get hurt. In the long run, you'll just go to another church or stop going. You don't come here to be loved. Some people do. We ought to surround that, love them, and raise them in the truth. But the majority of the core of this church, we should come here to be loved, not be loved. You don't come here to fit in. You come here to encourage and to lay down your life and manifest what you believe. I believe this, Pastor, and people would say this is denial, but I believe it's possible to have this many people and have no issues. Because we preach a passionate gospel and we're believers and we smother the issues with love and forgiveness and it never turns into a festering boil. He says, be careful, lest a root of bitterness come up in one and cause trouble for many. Wonder if everyone was taking account of our own hearts. And wonder if a root of bitterness did spring up and we just crushed it with mercy and love and wisdom. And wonder if we didn't make people enemies, but we saw people as potential for the kingdom. Wonder if your war isn't flesh and blood. Wonder if people never were our problem. Wonder if it was mindsets and wrong thinking. And strategies from hell. Wonder if people have never been our problem in the first place. I bet if you read scripture that tells you that's true. Then why have we let people decide who we are and how we are? When you go through a tragedy... A trauma, a tough thing. I know it's sensitive to talk about what we've all been through. Stuff. I can tell you mine. Don't, don't say, well, you don't know what I've been through. Well, stop. You don't know what everybody's been through. Don't make your story the, the story. And grab the principle. Be humble. You get hit with tragedy, and it affects your life, and it affects your view of God. That means you didn't have a strong foundation to begin with. You got to look at that because if that's the way it is, you can't tell me that you're convinced that that mentality is producing fruit and producing life. And are you ready to live the rest of your life that way and stand before him someday and answer for that? Come on. All I'm talking about is faith. All I'm talking about is living with belief. I've watched people go through tragedy and never recover and let the next 20 years be hinged on the tragedy and their view of God is skewed, their view of themselves is skewed, and even the way they treat others is different. They're a different person because of the tragedy. And the truth is you can find grace in the midst of everything by keeping your eyes on truth and truth will make you free. Truth will make you free. Yes, you went through the tragedy, but man, you shine. And God will work all things together for the good. And all of a sudden you can manifest him all the more through the things you've been through. Why? Because Jesus manifests himself all the more through the things he's been through and we ought to consider him because he's the author and the finisher of our faith and we look to him because he went through the cross and didn't deserve it and he despised the shame look into the joy set before him and the thing he was going to buy and purchase and he went through it all we ought to follow him that's scripture people come on do you hear how much scripture i'm sharing to back up the intensity of my heart like half the New Testament probably just poured out of my mouth today. So I haven't gotten up and just read out of this book, but you can tell I've read this book. This book is so inside of me. And it keeps me in a very healthy place through life. Because nothing's going to sneak up on me. Because I see. I'm ready. I'm prepared. I studied and showed myself approved of kept myself in the word and abide and remain in him and i'm serious about it so you just ain't going to sneak up on me with a little bit of offense you ain't going to sneak up on me with a little wrongdoing and catch my heart off guard and oh that hurt come on if you're living that way i'll hurt for you and when i'm praying for you it ain't because i'm ticked off and disgusted it's because i know if you knew who you were you wouldn't be living that way god would you have mercy Come on, if people loved God and were filled with Holy Spirit, would they have treated you the way they treated you? Well, why doesn't that matter more than what they did? Why is it so easy to cry for yourself instead of cry for them? Why is it so easy to be hurt instead of be hurting? Because of the fall of man. Some of us, all we've ever been taught is Jesus died to take us to heaven. It's not true. He died to put heaven back into you. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven.
Come on. We put that on a refrigerator. We probably ought to understand it and believe it. <laughs> See, because it feels sentimental. It's that warm rush. We feel close to God when we put scripture on the wall. When we sing these songs, the, the words are powerful. I'm serious. We could have sang that last song and we could have all just went home. I was, I was ready to go. I was like, yeah, just go rejoice. It talked about dancing. Some of us, we ain't dancing. <laughs> Are you all okay? Are you okay? See, if, if I was needy and, and insecure and worried about what you're thinking, right now, I'd say, I'll smile and tell me you love me. I want to be such a friend to you and with you. I want you to like me. But it has nothing to do with who I am and what I'm going to cry out. Getting your approval is not my goal. Sowing the clearest seed of truth out of my convictions is my highest goal. Whether you seem to be receiving it or not is even irrelevant to me. The kingdom of God is if a man scatters seed and if you don't sow, nothing grows. I'm pumped up. I'm very privileged man this morning because I had some serious feed bags and seed bags. I mean, hanging on me that you couldn't see. And I've been just sowing seed, sowing seed. See, because if you don't see it, you can never be it. But if you see it, now we have potential. Doesn't Satan work in the realm of blindness? He blinds the eyes of those who don't believe. You might think he's just talking about unbelievers that haven't prayed the sinner's prayer. Wonder if it's people that aren't believing all these scriptures I've quoted and not living the fruit of them. Wonder if unbelief is bigger than not praying the sinner's prayer. Are you with me? I got just a little bit of time. I have to almost uh, 1045. It's your pastor's fault. He gave me this much time. If you're struggling, take it out on him, man. <laughs> <laughs> Say, oh, no, he has like 13 more minutes. You can handle it. Really, we came this far. Don't bail out on me now. Don't leave. I'll call you at the door. I'm going to ask God for a word of knowledge and reveal your secrets. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. God would never do that. He wouldn't do that. Maybe in a private room. He wouldn't do that here. <coughs> I'm kidding. <coughs> was it a, I was in a counseling room with a young man. It was fascinating to me. It was a man and a, a lady. They wanted to get married and they weren't born again. They've never been to church. I'm not joking. I used an illustration because you get into church language, you get into Christianese. I mentioned Adam and Eve in a sentence, and they had no idea what I was talking about. The man never heard of Adam or Eve. He didn't know who they were. He didn't know who I was what I was talking about. He was so far removed. I said, you don't even know? He said, no. I said, you don't know anything about Jesus? He said, no. And I said, listen, man, your dad this, your dad that, and the reason you're a regular pot smoker, you smoke pot about six times a day because you're trying to fill something that only he can. He said, how do you know I smoke weed that much? I said, I see it right now. See, God reveals stuff like that to save a man. He's not exposing sin. He's rescuing a heart. But he wouldn't do that in this public service. But you get me alone with you, I just might. No. <laughs> but it was for the redemption of a boy. It wasn't pointing out his sin. It was saving a soul. And they ended up getting born again. And I ended up doing their wedding in a very unsaved atmosphere. And it was hilarious. No, I, I don't have time to tell the story, but you'd roll out of your chair. It was hilarious. No, no, but, but I, <laughs> that would take the whole service. It was so hilarious. It was so fun. Because I'm just not ashamed of the gospel. And I love people. And I don't know how to get agitated by people anymore. People don't irritate me. I cry for people. I don't first impress and judge and decide who I want to get close to and who I want to avoid. Everybody's worth the blood and has potential of his image. I don't judge a book by the cover. That way I can always get to the center chapters that might be unread. If you judge by the cover, you'll never look into the book. Oh, I'm preaching to you right now. 
See, some of us would say we couldn't live that way because we're so used to the other. Don't be deceived by the other and ever think it's normal. It's the fall of man. There's a redemption of your life and my life through the blood. Even my emotional makeup was so deceived and twisted. Nobody had to teach me to be angry. I didn't have to study and work at it. I was angry by instinct because I was self-centered at birth. The first thing a little toddler learns to say instead of dad and mom is usually, mm, no, mine, mm, mine, mine, eh, mine. You're telling me that was from the beginning? And then good Christian parents have mothers come thinking they're failing. Good Christian mothers like Jesus girls. Pastor, can we talk? I had one come to me. She said, I, I think my baby has a demon. And I'm like, what? <laughs> she said, well, I was talking sweet to her and I mentioned Jesus. And she went, yeah. I said, no, 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 honey, stop. I said, your little girl's going to need born again someday. She's going to need born again. She, she has the nature of Adam in her. So just you shine, you live like Christ, you manifest Christ, you cover her with love, you discipline her from the right heart, from love, for her sake, you model Jesus so that at a very young age, she realizes something in her and in you, and she says something to you, and you're tucking her in one night, and she says, Mommy, you're so different to me. What do you mean, honey? Well, and then you and then you stand there, sit there with her and hold her hand. And she says, Jesus, would you come in and take my life and live inside of me and help empower me and make me like mommy? Wouldn't that be fun? That sure beats condemnation and thinking you're failing as a parent and living with a sad countenance. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not doing well with Colossians 3. I think I'm just going to read it and I'll be done. I don't know if I can do this without preaching. This is scary. This is going to be hard. If you can go to Colossians 3, is there any way you can put Colossians 3 up there? Or is it too last minute? If you can't, you can't. I love New King James even. I'm asking a lot right now. They got New King James? They're that good? So I'm not putting them on the spot. Oh, guys. If you can get me up New King James, just holler when it's up there, guys. If you have a Bible, turn to Colossians 3. We're going to read this. And just let it speak to us. Oh, my. Thank you. You guys are the best. Oh, my goodness. Can we do this together? Is this New King James? Oh, it is. Oh, I'm excited. Why am I excited? Because I don't want old King James. Everything's new. It's new. It's new gospel. It's new. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, the only reason I don't read old King James is because I don't speak Elizabeth in English, English, and it just sounds funny to me. New King James is the old King James without the thou shouts and wilt nots and wilt thou. That's all. It just took the Elizabeth and English out of it. So don't get all freaked out by all the translation stuff. Yeah? But I figured since I'm in a new covenant, it's new wine, it's, you know, might as well go with new king. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that would be your justification if you're sitting there with a new American standard. See, you're in the covenant. You're in God. I'm just kidding. Okay, look. Since, since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. It's so hard not to preach. Ah. What time is it? Ooh, I'm just going to mess up. So watch. I won't get late, but I'm going to have to preach something. We hear a gospel so much. If you, if you listen, if you turn on TV, radio, you listen to the average sermon out there, it's usually something in it that promises to bless you, add something to your life, or give you something you feel like you need. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I'm not sure we've been taught to wake up and been taught to wake up thinking for what he's thinking for. I think we've been taught to wake up and seek him for what we need. So most of our prayer life is a list of things we need God to do, want God to do, and are hoping he does. I'm not sure how many of us have been taught to just wake up and think for the kingdom. To seek the things that are above, not on the earth. Because you're in the earth, but you're not... Of the earth. Wow. Set. See how important it is? See where your mind wants to go? See how good he is as a father? Set your mind on things above. Don't let it go anywhere else. 
not on the things of the earth. For you died. See, nobody taught me that growing up. They just said I prayed a prayer to go to heaven. Nobody told me I died. They told me I prayed a prayer to go to heaven. Come on, who knows what I'm saying? Nobody told me I died. They said you prayed a prayer to go to heaven, and when the bell rings, you're in. Nobody told me I died. You can't live until you die. You can't incorporate Jesus into your life. He becomes your life. You can't mix the old and the new. You die. You're buried into death, in baptism, into Jesus' death. When you get baptized, you're buried into death. You reckon yourself dead to sin and alive unto God. You come up as the, by the glory of the Father, he raised Jesus from the dead, so you shall walk in the newness of life. Nobody ever taught me that growing up. Jesus taught me that in my bedroom. So I went, I don't even tell people this because people will say it ain't legal or something. I baptized myself when I saw that. I was in my room. I went and filled the tub. I crawled in and I it was the most holy, amazing thing. Holy Spirit was waiting for me when I came out of the water. It was incredible. I just baptized myself with a whole heart crying. And I went under and called everything that ever was dead. And I said, when I come up, everything you are alive in me. I baptized myself. Nobody in the room. I had a man say, well, did you baptize yourself in the name of Jesus or the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I said, I said, I don't even remember. It was so powerful. He said, well, then you're not saved if it wasn't the name of Jesus. Isn't that tragic that we get so doctrinally legalistic? My kids were standing there and the man's telling me I'm not saved two years in. I've seen healings and miracles. My kids have a brand new daddy. I said, maybe you ought to ask my children if I'm saved. Instead of this wicked religious doctrine thing. I said, man, when you stopped the car to hand me a track, I thought you were doing a good thing and I praised you for it. But I take that back. You're doing great damage. I wish you'd go get a grip, sir. You're hurting people. Your legalism is an enemy to everything God's trying to do in people's lives. I talked to him really straight. Was I mad at him? No. I'm trying to pull him out of delusion because he's telling me who has had fun with Jesus for two years and my kids see a brand new daddy. My marriage is amazing. And Jesus is Lord of my life. And he's telling me I'm not saved, that I'm living in deception because I didn't pray in Jesus' name when I was water baptized. I don't even know if I did. I might have. I didn't remember because I didn't remember I couldn't have been saved, he said. Oh, guys, let's stay a million miles from this stuff. You died. You died. Come on. You died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, here it is, when Christ who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, because this is true, put to death. Don't modify. Don't find a healthy balance. Don't self-control. Put to death. Kill your life the way you knew it. Fornication, sexual passion and desire, uncleanness, evil desire. It's all covetousness. Everything in that list is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons that just continue to disobey. In which you yourselves once walked. That's why you don't judge them. That's why you're not self-righteous. That's why you're not judgmental. You've been forgiven. You've been delivered. But you were in that group not long ago. You yourself once walked when you lived that way. But now, now, right now, you yourselves are to put off. All these things, anger. It's not anger management, people. You put it off. It was never yours. Self-centeredness is the platform for anger. Self-centeredness is the platform for wrath. Self-centeredness is the platform for malice. But you died and your life is hidden with God in Christ. But now you yourselves put off these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Come on, don't lie to one another. Why? Because you put off this old man that we just described and his deeds. And you have put on the new man. Who is he? He's renewed in knowledge, in agreement with the image of the very one who created him. See, I found all this in my Bible. This is not my sermon. It's what he's been saying the whole time. Oh my goodness, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, and circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and he's in all. Now here's the new man. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. Remember, put on who? The new man. So now when you see put on, who's he describing? The new man. He's describing the image of God. The image of God is right here. Watch. Remember, put off these things, put to death these things. You put off the old man. That was the list. 
Now we put on the new man who's created in God's image. Here's the list of God's image. Tender mercies. Just weigh your heart. Are these things you thrive in? Are these things you have to work toward? Are these things truly the expression of your life? Come on. Tender mercies. Kindness. Humility. Meekness. Patience. Bearing with one another. And forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love. Because it's the bond that perfects us. You see how powerful that is? Watch. Here's the beauty of what I'm saying this morning. That right there is for everybody in the room. What you believe and what you really want is on you. But you can live this apart from any other factor in your life when you wrap faith around it and go to prayer about it. When you make this matter more than what's going on around you, this can be your life because he's calling you to it. You can't say, yeah, but brother, you don't know what I'm going through right now. What you're going through is not contingent on you becoming this. You becoming this decides how you handle what you're going through. Are you with me? You can't say, but you don't know what these people are putting me through. Well, you ought to run that by Jesus, because if he ever said that on his way to the cross, he wouldn't have made it. You don't take account of suffered wrongs. You live this way because it's the word of God and the just shall live by faith. Are you all hearing? You see what we do? We die to everything we've ever been. How much scripture did I show you this morning, people? You die to everything you've ever been so you can what? Raise up and live in everything he's always been. Christ in you. The hope of what? Glory. Father, I thank you for the word this morning. I thank you for grace in this house. And I just thank you for moving in our hearts in a very special, wonderful way. And I ask that this word would just rest on many words that Sheldon has brought and John has brought. Just bring grace and expression and fruit to this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.